to you from the studios of East Ridge Public Radio, uninterrupted and free from pesky interns. It's Volumes of Fear. Prepare yourself for a tale of terror and suspense. Presented by Crimson Knight Productions. This is Volumes of Fear. Good evening, my loyal lunatics. This is Volumes of Fear, and I am your host, Piedmont Montgomery. In just the shake of a werewolf's tail, I shall bring to you a recording that I made recently. This recording took place at an event that was invitation only and held at the East Ridge Civic Center. It was quite the happening as Dr. Rundle Burgess, the local mad scientist, held an unveiling of his latest project. I took with me an audio recording device and decided to document the event. Following the playback of my recording, I shall interject briefly, and then we will hear the conclusion of how this science experiment went from monster to monster. Listeners, this is Piedmont Montgomery, and I am currently on location at the East Ridge Civic Center for the unveiling of Dr. Wendell Burgess's latest scientific experiment. We're in the facility's main meeting room. It's rather big, like a gymnasium. At one end of this room is a stage with rows of chairs. Oh, oh, they are those cheap, flimsy folding chairs, too. Someone's going to break a neck someday. Anyway, there seems to be a healthy number of attendees. Details have been difficult to obtain as well. I have the invitation with me now, and it reads. You are cordially invited to the latest experiment unveiling of one Dr. Wendell Burgess. Presentation begins promptly at 7 p.m. on the 15th of this month. A QA and a shall follow, with cake and punch served at the conclusion. Regretfully, no vegan option available. So, as you can understand, there is a curiosity in the room as to what the doctor could be unveiling. I shall now get some interviews from some of the guests in the room. I'd like to know a little something about Dr. Burgess, and perhaps we can shed some light on what to expect from this evening's festivities. Listeners, we're back. Joining me currently is Dr. Joseph Spittle. Dr. Spittle is a colleague of Dr. Burgess. Well, I wouldn't say we are colleagues. Oh, really? No, we're not colleagues. In fact, I sit on several medical malpractice review boards that have followed Wendell Burgess's work throughout the years. We've found his work to be perverse. Fascinating. Immoral. Intriguing. And downright dangerous. Thrilling. And we're not even sure that he is, in fact, a licensed doctor. We have reason to believe that he never completed his medical training. I am only here today to report back to the committees which I serve. So you don't really know him then? Or maybe you're friends in passing, like distant acquaintances? Mr... Uh, Montgomery. Piedmont Montgomery of Volumes of Fear. Volumes of what? Uh, Fear. Volumes of Fear. It's It's a scripted horror comedy podcast. Quite revered, actually. Right. Uh, Look, Mr. Montgomery, I appreciate your interest in science. However, this man is certifiable. One might even say he is mad. All the best scientists tend to be. Hardly. Do you know anything about science? Why are you even here? What qualifications do you have? Your being here is just another example of how Bush League Burgess actually is. Inviting nutjobs and vagrants to these events diminishes the integrity of science, and I'll tell you one more thing. Okay, lunatics, I think I've finally got someone here who is in the know. Standing next to me is Florence Lumpnut, a reporter with the Eastridge Gazette. Now, Florence, you're always reporting the big story and the exciting stuff. And selfishly, I must interject that we're still waiting on you to do a piece about the volumes of fear. 
Volumes of what? Uh, fear. Volumes of Fear, the highly popular scripted horror comedy podcast. We, we can chat later, of course. But in the interim, I was curious what you might be able to tell me about Dr. Burgess and what he has planned for today. Okay, Dr. Wendell Burgess is originally from Bavaria. His father was a baron, and the whole family is very wealthy. He came over to the States to attend Peaksville Medical School. His date of graduation is unknown, but he did show a keen interest in biological manipulation. He's fascinated by life and what it takes to create it. He considers himself a scientist, a doctor, a philosopher, an inventor, a tortured soul, a poet, a world-class traveling jet-setting confirmed bachelor, but above all, a creator. My, someone has done their homework, haven't they? It was all on his website. Web site? Yeah, website, like on the internet. Of course, of course. I, I knew that. I, I'm rather proficient with the worldwide um, in- internet. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. Dr. Burgess seems really self absorbed. His website makes him out to be this big deal, but there isn't anything substantial on it. Nothing to back up his claims. I've also heard a lot of strange rumors about him. Oh, something juicy, I hope. I heard he's conducted a bunch of strange and weird scientific experiments with body parts, and that he's obsessed with creating something that people would consider impossible. Well, my curiosity is certainly piqued. Yeah, mine too. But I wouldn't get too excited. Apparently, this guy has tried to get the science community to listen to his outlandish ideas for years. Nobody wants to take him seriously because he's so goofy and, like I said, weird. And like the fangs of a vampire at a sorority party, my interest continues to grow. Listeners, those chimes mean that the presentation is about to begin. The house lights are beginning to fade, and I must make my way to the stage area and find a good seat. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, I think I'm recording again. Uh, Yes, I am. I found a seat here. Not too distant from the stage. The curtains are still drawn shut. I imagine any minute now they'll be pulled and the presentation will begin. Hmm. Right on cue. The stage has been revealed to be empty, save for a podium and what looks like a giant box that is covered with a sheet. There seems to be some noises or grunts or mumbles from whatever's behind the sheet. Oh, here comes Dr. Burgess now. He's taking center stage. (coughs) He's a thin gentleman, rather wiry. He actually looks somewhat malnourished. His hair, though, is finely combed. He has a pair of glasses and he's wearing a lab coat. A bit cliche, but he must keep with appearances. I believe he's about to begin. Let's listen in, shall we? (coughs) Crazy, wacko, nut job, unqualified, twisted, heavily odorous, and mentally unstable. That is how so many of you in this very room describe me and my work over the years. But tonight, you will eliminate those words from any description of me. And after you see what I have created, never again will you call me anything but genius. I came to this dump of a town for solitude and to work on my experiments, free from the ever-watching, nosy-rosy medical watchdog groups who couldn't and wouldn't understand my work. And it was here, in this cesspool known as East Ridge, that I created the most amazing thing possible. Life. That's right. With these two hands, I created a man. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you my creation. My word. (sighs) Listeners, up on the stage, I am seeing a, a cage. That must have been what the sheet was concealing. Inside of the cage, though, is a, a creature. It's tall, and its frame is massive, its clothes tattered and torn, its skin green. Medical stitches abound its body, and electrodes protrude from both sides of its neck. 
This thing is looking around slowly but inquisitively. What is the meaning of this, Burgess? What have you done to this man? It's Dr. Spittle. He spoke with us earlier. He's standing up, questioning Dr. Burgess about the thing in the cage. What have I done? I'll tell you what I have done. I created life. This thing, this creation, it's alive. (laughs) This is actually a good time to do the Q&A. Since you're so very outspoken, Dr. Spittle, how about you ask the first question? What is this thing you have in that cage? This thing is a man. Not created by the divine or by nature, but by me. Constructed from donated parts. I put it all together, and then through the manipulation of electricity, I gave it life. Are you saying that you built this man? Yes, I did build him. Now, I prefer the term create, but I can understand how a close-minded person like yourself needs such blue-collar terminology. How did you do this? Are you gonna hog the floor all day, Joey? Let's give someone else a chance to ask a question. You can stop flapping your gums for a minute. I believe the little lady in the back had her hand raised. Yes, Florence Lumpnut, Eastridge Gazette. Dr. Burgess, how were you able to create a man? I know this might not be easy for you to understand with your little brain, but here goes. The process first required creating a human body. To do that, I needed body parts. I acquired those through various channels. Next, I used my background in medical training to stitch and sew everything together. Each appendage needed to be unique, enhanced, and reworked, for a lack of a better word. Not to mention that everything that went into making the body needed to come from large specimens. Hence, his large frame. Bit of a baby Huey, if you ask me. Then it was just a matter of getting the electricity to work and give the body and brain that special kick it needed to begin functioning. I could go into the minutia, but I haven't the time nor you the brainial ability to comprehend. How rude. Yeah, well guess what, babe? I'm about to be the toast of the town, so you may want to do better at buttering me up. Next question. Uh, yes, Mr. Burgess. Doctor, besides this experiment and the prison sentence, I think I've earned the right to be addressed as doctor. All right, Dr. Burgess. My name is James Crumwoody, and I'm chief constable here in East Ridge. You said you made this thing from various body parts. Where exactly did you get these body parts? Were they from a certified and licensed body parts dealer? I've got a guy. Good enough. You bumpkins are so easy to please. Next question. Let's see. The ethnic gentleman. Mi nombre es Pablo Gutierrez Rodríguez. Soy ciudadano de un país latinoamericano que está planificando una insurrección de su gobierno. ¿Estará interesado en ensamblar un ejército de hombres que ayudará en nuestra campaña? Por supuesto que le pagamos bien, con dinero y con mujeres, y sería considerado un héroe en nuestro país. Pudiera hacer lo que le guste. I'm sorry. All I heard was clicks and whistles. Next question. The dweeb over there. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. My name is Nicholas Dweeb, and I am a concerned citizen of Eastridge. Ooh, great. The peanut gallery has found its voice. Is there any chance of this creature becoming a menace and running a rampage throughout our community? The odds of that are minimal, and even if it did run a rampage throughout this community, it would only be doing society a favor, considering the need to expunge this Get mark of a town off of maps. Next! I think this is a good opportunity to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Burgess? The homeless man, here, in the second row. Homeless? I'm, I'm not, I'm not without a home. Anyway, Dr. Burgess, being a man of your intelligence and bravado, I'm sure you're familiar with all of the media based off of the Frankenstein story. In all those stories, there is a common mistake that is made whereby the brain used is often that of a criminal. Surely you didn't make the same mistake, did you? Finally, a question was serious discussion. The answer is yes. 
<laughs> yes, I did use a criminal brain. And the reason why is simple. I wanted to show that my true genius doesn't stop at creating life, but that it extends to the controlling of life. Now, I can only imagine that all of you weak-minded troglodytes will probably all have certain fears and anxieties. And to quell all of that, I will give a demonstration. Please, move your field of vision to the cage that contains my creation. Listeners, Dr. Burgess has fielded my question and has walked to the cage that holds his creation. He is face to face with the thing. As part of this demonstration, I shall now insult my creation and incite anger within him. You will see that he will get worked up like any other person would. But, under my guidance, he will not become violent. Observe. You are ugly. You have a foul odor. Your clothes are tattered and unsightly akin to the vagrant that prompted this very demonstration. I don't agree with that statement, but it seems like Dr. Burgess's creation is becoming agitated. You have food in your teeth, and the little hair you have is a mess. If I didn't know better, I'd assume your parents were siblings. You are grotesque. You're an abomination. You'll come out to nothing in this world because you are a monster. As you can hear, the creation is heavily disconcerted. He's grabbing at the cage as though he wants to get out. Now, as your master and creator, I command you to stand down. <laughs> I don't believe the creation is responding. I think Dr. Burgess struck a nerve in him. I thought you said you could control this monster. I can, like anyone else. He just needs a minute to- (laughs) Listeners, the creation has just reached through the cage and has grabbed Dr. Burgess by the throat. He's strangling him. That monster is choking Burgess and killing him! It's a monster, it's dangerous. Someone do something! Listeners, before my very eyes, I'm witnessing this monster strangle Dr. Burgess. I think Dr. Burgess is doomed unless someone will help. His face is turning a deep red. He hasn't much time. Strike that. I think he's dead. What do we do? It's killed Burgess! We could be next! Someone do something! Listeners, there's a panic amongst the crowd. Chaos has broken out, yet on stage, the monster, who is still in his cage, has become docile, placid even. Everyone, remain calm. I am going to approach this monster's cage. Dr. Spittle has taken the stage. He's slowly moving toward the cage where the monster is located. Easy now, big fella. I just want to talk. (sighs) He doesn't seem agitated any longer. In fact, he's pretty calm. That spit guy is right. The monster's more relaxed now. It's being cooperative. We should let him out of his cage of oppression. Someone did something. All right, show's over, everyone. Let's file out of here, calmly and orderly. No pushing, no shoving. We are being ushered out of the meeting room here at the Civic Center. Dr. Spittle is still on stage. He's seemingly talking with the monster. I'll have an update for you when convenient. Stand by, listeners. Loyal lunatics, I am back now in the safe and secure confines of East Ridge Public Radio. And I wish more than anything that I could bring to you a bookend for this story. But alas, my narration is finished. I now leave the conclusion of this story up to Wanda Kakaluti of East Ridge Public Radio News. Her recent news story for the radio station serves as a fine bookend, and it will explain to you how the monster became a monster. With approval from East Ridge Public Radio, and without further hesitation, here is her recent news story. You're listening to East Ridge Public Radio. The town that's a scream to live in. 
Good evening, this is Wanda Kakaludi, and you're listening to East Ridge Public Radio News. It was only six days ago when deranged scientist and self-proclaimed Dr. Wendell Burgess unveiled unto the world his latest science experiment. This experiment was literally a male human that Burgess created inside of his laboratory right here in East Ridge. The man was constructed from body parts that Burgess acquired through various illegal means and was then animated with electrical currents. The unveiling was meant to be a major milestone in the world of science, but tragedy occurred as Burgess attempted to demonstrate that the man-made man could be controlled, despite it having the brain of a criminal. As part of the demonstration, Burgess hurled insult after insult at his creation, and in the end, the creation became a monster and reached through its cage and strangled the troubled scientist until he was dead. Dr. Joseph Spittle, a noted member of the medical community, was in attendance at the event and played a critical role in determining that the monster was no longer a threat. After panic broke out amongst the crowd, and of course Burgess's death, I knew there was going to be a riot. But before I surrendered the room to mob justice, I wanted to know for sure if this monster truly was evil and capable of doing worse. After some observation, I found that he just didn't like being insulted, and that when treated with kindness, he was actually something of a gentle giant. While the unveiling was a scene of chaos that resulted in the death of Wendell Burgess, as well as an injury when someone fell over in their chair, local authorities decided not to press charges. Here's East Ridge Chief of Police, James Crumwoody. Well, the scene was pretty hectic, and there are plenty of witnesses who saw the monster kill Wendell Burgess. But, uh, when you think about it, uh, the monster is only a few weeks old. Arresting him, trying him, and then, uh, executing him would, uh, it'd be like trying to do the same thing to an infant. It didn't know what it was doing was wrong, so we decided not to press charges. In fact, uh, nobody was really sorry to see Burgess get his just due. He was a bit of a jerk by all accounts, and the monster, well, he's actually a decent guy. Decent guy is only one way of describing the monster. He's become the toast of the town due to his charm and childlike innocence. He's actually so well-liked that he's been attending various community events, from restaurant openings to park dedications. Monster Mania is sweeping the countryside with our new friend, and his popularity is soaring. Rumors abound that this drooling, partially brain-dead, lumbering hulk is considering a political run for the town council. Next up on the schedule for East Ridge's newest celebrity is an appearance at the ribbon-cutting of the new East Ridge Reservoir. He'll be on hand to take photos, and will be picking flowers with children beforehand. I'm Wanda Kakaludi, and you're listening to East Ridge Public Radio News. We would like to thank Wanda Kakaluti for providing the story that serves as a bookend to how the monster became a monster. With that, it's time to conclude this episode of Volumes of Fear. We would like to thank Crimson Knight Productions, our show's presenter. They always provide such great help in producing Volumes of Fear. Find us on the usual social media outlets and give us a like. Oh, and I nearly forgot, we would like to extend our well wishes to the radio station's intern, Dewey. He had an accident while riding his bicycle, and he took quite the tumble. Apparently the brakes gave out while he was riding downhill, so you can imagine it was quite the situation. Yeah, get well soon, Dewey. I like the insinuation, Winston. I'm Piedmont Montgomery, and this has been Volumes of Fear. As always, don't forget to share the scare and like the lunacy. This episode of Volumes of Fear featured the acting talents of Ed Rosary, Tom Rock, Rachel Collins, Swirl, J.C. Rositas, Shannon Riley, Derek DeBoer, Andy Collins, and Odell Osagara Jr. It was produced by Andy Collins and J.C. Rositas and written by Andy Collins. Audio editing and mixing was by J.C. Rositas. Original music was by Swirl. Artwork was provided by Derek DeBoer. This episode was presented by Crimson Knight Productions. Visit them online at vivacomp.net. Like Volumes of Fear on Facebook and Instagram, or you will suffer horrible things.